Welcome to BIB Today, the daily business podcast from the Newsroom of Business in Vancouver. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief. One of our community's most prominent lawyers, Robert Hager of the Phillips Hager and North Law Firm, was instrumental in raising awareness of pancreatic cancer. He established a center to spur research, Pancreas Center BC, only to pass away months later in 2011. The Hager family now has donated a record $5 million to advance pancreatic cancer research at the center in honor of Bob Hager and the center's 10 year anniversary. Today, November 17th, is World Pancreatic Cancer Day when we reflect on research advances and the stubborn challenges of pancreatic cancer. I'm joined now by his wife, Judy, and by Dr. Daniel Renew, the co-director of Pancreas Center BC. Good to have you both with us. Great to be here. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah. Thank you very well, much. Uh, um, Judy, let me start with this. You know, uh, um, you know, your your husband um, uh, had his diagnosis. Um, really decided that that it was important to obviously have a, a legacy of some sort here, uh, as he as he fought. He fought a, a short uh, short battle with this, and and unfortunately, with pancreatic cancer, it is it's often a losing battle. Um, what do you feel his wishes were in terms of trying to advance our understanding of, of pancreatic cancer? Uh, I think he was a businessman to start with. It was Philip Sager and North, an investment counseling firm that he belonged to. And he was kind of a cut and dried person. So when he had this diagnosis and Dr. Scudamore said, I'm sorry, Bob, I really can't do very much with this surgery. Uh, and he only lived four months. He was really kind of determined to sit down with people from BC Cancer and BGH and um, some from his Philip Sager and North Firm to see what could be done to set up something that would advance treatment and care and recognition of this cancer. So in that four, you know, that short four months, uh, Pancreas Center BC was kind of up and running. And mm -hmm. that's over the last 10 years. Um, has done really well with Dr. Renouf, Dr. Schaefer, and the people that they are, you know, able to work with to advance uh, recognition of this disease. As you know, as as the benefactor in this case, uh, in you know, what what do you set out with, and how do you sustain the the mission in this one? You know, what what is it that you um, involve yourself in, and then what what is you know. Um, operationally left to uh, to the others are you asking me that question yeah yeah, yeah. Going on. Um, I think that what we have done and which um, pancreas center BC has been so good about is that we meet our family my daughter's Leslie and Shelley and we will meet maybe twice a year with dr. Renouf and dr. Schaefer and others so we are always kind of kept apprised of how the advances are going and what is needed. And after 10 years, um, we were approached about a donation and it's taken kind of many months to get organized. But uh, I know my husband would be delighted to carry on with this. And certainly every time I read in the paper that someone in the obituary column, which is not something we all want to do, has died after a short battle with pancreatic cancer, I still find myself letting out a big sigh and thinking, oh my gosh. So there's no doubt that our family was really happy to be able to carry on with what Bob inherited, and financially he's made that possible. Dr. Renouf, in, in my understanding is that we're somewhere around 75% of all cancers being treatable um, and curable in a lot of ways with people and, and, and the way it, it inflicts upon them. Uh, but pancreatic cancer seems to me to still be a bit of an outlier here. Uh, survival rate, very, very low. And, and uh, where treatments are still a bit of a mystery in all of this. How does that inform the work you do and how you deal with people? who are, are, are stricken by pancreatic cancer and, and looking for this kind of hope? Yeah, that's a great question, Kirk. Uh, pancreatic cancer, I think, first and foremost, is much more common than people think. 
And it's for many years, we kind of talked about it as a silent disease. The symptoms uh, can be there for a long time and people aren't typically diagnosed until it's at an advanced stage. That's a, one of the main issues with this cancer. We have no good ways to detect it early, no good screening tests. And it also is silent in that people haven't talked about this cancer and it doesn't garner the same amount of attention, the same amount of uh, research dollars uh, needed to make advances as other cancers have. And uh, as of this year, cancer, pancreatic cancer is now the third leading cause of cancer-related death. So mm. it's, it is a, it's a very common cause of cancer-related death and it's, and it's projected by 2030 to be the second leading cause of cancer-related death. So it's really a, a, a very critical area that we need to advance our understanding of, of both diagnosing this cancer and, and new ways to treat this cancer uh, because it's, it's a, it is a very common uh, and difficult problem. Yeah. Uh, um, can you explain, probably in a way that I that even all understand, um, the mystery of the pancreas? Why, why is it that we, we don't seem to understand sufficiently in order to, um, to, to rectify the cancer that impinges on it? Yeah, I think there's really two main issues. The first is that your, your pancreas is located right at the back of your abdomen. Uh, and it doesn't have a, a kind of a typical nerve supply. And so because of those two components, uh, a tumor can grow in the pancreas and you would never know that. Uh, yeah. and, and one would not know until it could have been there for months or years. Uh, and uh, it's difficult to detect on imaging especially at an early stage. It's not like a, a breast cancer where you notice a lump. We don't have any screening tests like mammograms or colonoscopies or prostate exams to detect this cancer early. And so for many cancers, for breast cancer, 80% uh, of breast cancers are diagnosed in what we call an early stage setting where they could have surgery and be cured. The, it, the reverse is true in pancreatic cancer where 80% are diagnosed when the cancer is already spread, uh, and only 20% or less are diagnosed in a setting where they uh, can be cured with surgery. The, the second uh, big problem is that uh, this type of cancer is quite resistant to chemotherapy. Uh, mm. And uh, despite kind of many years of trials of new types of chemotherapy, uh, we have made minimal advances. It's, uh, it's hard to get chemotherapy into the pancreatic cancer cells to work. Uh, and as we've made advances in oncology, and you allude to some of the, you know, the ability to treat many cancers, some of the main advances have been related to target therapy, and now more recently immunotherapy, and ways to induce the body's immune system to recognize and attack the cancer. That's been a revolution in, in other hard to treat cancers like melanoma. We haven't seen the same uh, success with with uh, immunotherapy and pancreatic cancer up to this point. Yeah. And yet you give over your life to trying to uh, resolve some of these mysteries. Um, can I ask you why? Does it sound like a terrible question, but why? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, I, I, maybe I painted a bit of a bleak picture, but the, the, the flip side is that we are making advances and the, 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 our ability to treat pancreatic cancer has really improved dramatically over the last decade. And when I first started in this area, we had uh, less chemotherapy options. And in, in the advanced setting, if someone had a, a metastatic cancer, the chance of them living for longer than a year was very low. Uh, and that's in the last 10 years, that's changed quite significantly where I see a number of patients uh, on a regular basis that are living two, three, four years beyond with a good quality of life, still working, still enjoying times with their family, even in a setting where the cancer was had spread to the liver or lungs at the outset. Uh, so we are, we're, we're able to, to use information that we're finding in the research realm and convert it into managing patients in a very short time frame. And I think that's one of the really exciting areas uh, coming from a, a research background, you would do research in, you know, in my undergrad degree in fruit flies and things like that, where you, you think, well, maybe this will 
will lead to changes in how we treat people 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road. Whereas now we're doing, uh, we're when we discover something, a new way to treat a cancer, we can convert that into, into the clinic in, in terms of months. So it's, it is very exciting and it keeps you uh, kind of up at night thinking about this, knowing that uh, the things that we're discovering in the research realm can be used to, to, to treat patients that are dealing with this cancer right now. Yeah, the, the extent of it, the numbers, the data that you provided uh, earlier um, would suggest to me also that scientists now recognize um, a, kind, a different urgency about it, um, a, a, a need to, to tackle this. When you look at what is going on in the wider world, uh, Dr. Renouf, um, you know, can you can you start to see enough momentum there to shed some hope? Definitely. I think momentum is a very good word. And I've seen a dramatic change in the momentum related to pancreatic cancer research worldwide over the last decade. Uh, again, 10 years ago, there was very little research done relatively uh, compared to other cancer types. And now uh, there's at every kind of large oncology meeting, there's a large amount of time focused on pancreatic cancer. There's, there's many pancreatic cancer specific meetings, pancreatic sp cancer specific grants, and the worldwide community is extremely well connected with each other uh, to, to work together, share findings, uh, and bring forward you know, the newest treatments to our patients in a, in a very short time frame. So it is, it is very exciting that there is a huge amount of momentum in this area. Yeah. Judy, I want to talk a little bit about, you, you know, your, your husband's, uh, uh, his, his late life commitment into this to, to establish something. Um, would he have been satisfied with the progress over the last 10 years? Would, would this have been still galling to him that there was no answer yet? Of course, he was that kind of person. He made investments, you know, decisions on a <laughs> basis and uh, was always looking for a good outcome. But he also invested long term when he knew that the product or the company was worth the wait because he knew results would would come eventually. So and he liked startups, people who had uh, inspiration and the drive to go forward. So when this kind of began, yes, he he would be pleased with how things are going and he would be whispering in my ear, do something again so that this momentum can move forward. Yeah. I, I wonder, Judy, too, um, I think, you know, of course it's wonderful that that people with means are are philanthropically assisting uh, systems that that need these funds, uh, that need this support. Um, but in the end, does, does, does it not worry you a little bit about about the system itself and, and how much support it is going to need in the time ahead to deal with it and that it, it is going to be more and more dependent on philanthropy to to, to give it that boost that's, that we all know is necessary? Well, this is another healthcare issue and government issue with, with funding, of course, but I think when people get behind a momentum, then other organizations notice, and I think other fundings maybe can come forth from that. So I'm, I'm hopeful about that. And um, I think the fact that both of us started out with very humble beginnings uh, and we still or I still live in the same house that we bought years ago. Uh, I don't think Bob ever thought about personal funds, but often thought about what can he do. He used to say to me, you know, Jude, doctors should be making the money that our firm is making because they are doing good things for people to lengthen their life. So um, I think this is such an important thing, and I'm very happy that Bob has enabled us to do this as a family. Yeah. Dr. Renouf, um, you know, in, in your situation where you take a look at a system like this, you know 
what the requirements are economically in order to do this vast amount of research to 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 basically collaborate globally in a lot of cases. Um, can the system fulfill its objectives without philanthropy? Do you think? Well, I think where philanthropy is is so key is in is in supporting innovation, and uh, and so I think a, an example of an area that that Judy and her family have supported in the past is uh, is related to uh, genetic testing for inherited causes of pancreatic cancer. And uh, we've known and, and increasingly know that there are certain inherited uh, uh, genetic uh, predispositions. One, the most common one is something called a BRCA mutation, which puts you at risk for, is well known to put you at risk for breast and ovarian cancer but also puts you at risk of developing pancreatic and we now know prostate cancer as well. And five to 8% of all pancreatic cancers uh, come from, uh, are, are found in patients who have BRCA mutations. And that has very important implications, both in terms of what type of treatment that we use. We use different treatments in that setting, but also uh, very importantly, uh, we know that uh, we can screen patients' families uh, and and prevent cancers. We can prevent breast and ovarian cancer if we screen in patients that have these mutations. So that that testing for that is not uh, was not kind of covered uh, as part of a anywhere in Canada as a standard test for pa for pancreatic cancer unless you had uh, a very significant family history. And yeah. uh, Judy said, well, why don't we just test it on everyone? That's what we wanted to do. Just test everyone knowing that our criteria were missing people. And so through philanthropy, we were able to test every pancreatic cancer patient in the province for BRCA testing. And we, we published a study and demonstrated that we were finding a lot more of these cases than we would have expected to find if we just met, used the previous criteria. And based on that, it is now uh, covered through the ministry. So I think that's an example of where we were able to do something kind of outside the box uh, proof of concept, and now it's it's out of philanthropy and into kind of the healthcare system. We're still yeah. the only province in Canada doing that, uh, but I think this is where we can kind of push the envelope, say what what is the best possible way to to manage these patients, and then uh, make an argument that this should now be the the funded through the healthcare system. I'll uh, I'll appear instantly incompetent in discussing this, so uh, I'm good, but I'll try to ask you the best question I can on this one. But do these genetic markers then permit you to, um, with the early intervention, then to do anything that would help people yet avert? Yeah. So I guess in in terms of preventing the cancer, so we're testing patients that are already diagnosed with the cancer. But, but we will then, if someone is found to have one of these uh, mutations, then their whole family will be tested. And so uh, they, we do know that they can advert or be, uh, prevent cancers or early diagnose with cancers. Uh, there's good evidence of, of things to do for breast and ovarian cancer uh, to the extent that some people will undergo prophylactic surgeries to prevent these cancers. There's mm -hmm. less evidence in terms of specifically preventing pancreatic cancer, but we do, uh, there are tests that we do, including imaging with MRI and, and another type of imaging called an endoscopic ultrasound to follow patients to try to pick up these cancers as early as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but we do know for certain that knowing this information will prevent breast and ovarian cancer in these patients. Judy, last uh, question to you. Um, in a it arises, I think, from the, the journey that you've now had uh, over, you know, about 11 years now. And, um, and, and I wonder what your advice would be to, to families um, that, that are, you know, that suddenly find themselves uh, in this situation uh, with someone with, with uh, pancreatic cancer and, and what to do if the battle fails, how, how to deal with that um, failure and, and, and what you go on with after that? Oh, that's kind of a difficult question. 
going on after that when there has been a failure and the loved person has gone uh i think is is an individual thing but i think if you can find something that propels you to make a difference whether it's helping somebody on the street or whatever your particular cause is then i think your life has meaning and if it's possible to donate to pancreas center bc um, to make a difference in someone else's life then i think particularly at this particular time, it would be very important to do that. So, yes, I think so. And I think for people who are unsure about why do I suddenly have a bit of diabetic issues or other things which might lead to pancreatic cancer, it's important to go to your family doctor. And it's important that the family doctors be informed about early warning signs of pancreatic cancer. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your candor and, and uh, you know, in, in your loss, uh, you, you found a way, I think, to carry forward uh, the spirit of someone. And, and I think that's, that's a wonderful thing to do. And Dr. Renuko, thank you so much for your commitment into research on this. And thank you both of you for talking today on this World Pancreatic Cancer Day. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much for having us, Kirk. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief at BIV. Thanks a lot for watching.